Good afternoon, uh, everyone. This is, uh, it's five o'clock in New York. Uh, good afternoon, wherever you are. It's a pleasure for me to talk about the role of protective genes and exceptional longevity of, uh, in humans. Um, I do want to mention that uh, you can submit questions during my talk, and I'll be happy to look at those questions and, uh, and answer them uh, eventually. So the first slide that I want to show you is, is crucial to understand the next 30 minutes or so because it shows the relationship between death and age for variety of disease. And your people who are interested in variety of disease or specializing in, in specific diseases. And you see here that uh, age is a major risk factor for those disease and it goes up in a logarithmic fashion, right? The y-x is a logarithmic. So you, when you go uh, from a, in, in either heart disease or cancer or diabetes or Alzheimer, when you go from the ages of 20, 30 to the age of 80, the mortality increases from 10 to 1,000 folds. Uh, while, for example, cholesterol is a risk factor for heart disease, but it's a threefold risk. Aging is really a major risk. And from where we stand in the biology of aging, we are saying, look, uh, unless you delay aging, you cannot really make an impact of, of the, on diseases. The best that you can hope for is that to switch one disease for another. So we have been really great at uh, preventing cardiovascular disease, but this is a local treatment with stand and bypass. And what happens to those patients who are now surviving heart disease? Uh, well, they're getting within two years cancer or Alzheimer or diabetes because we never delayed the aging. We just delayed, delayed a specific disease. And this is the background for the research uh, that I'm going to talk about. Now, if this was a live coverage, if I was speaking to you, I would ask you the question and it would be interesting to see your response. I know what will, your response would be. I'm asking you, do we human age at different rates? Do you know somebody who's 50 years old that looks more like he's 40? Do you know somebody who's 50 years old that looks like they're, they're 60? And I tell you, most of you are saying probably yes. We intuitively know that we human age at different rates. And yet nobody has asked really, so what is the difference that some people are aging faster than the others? And, and, and how can we use it in order to uh, delay aging? And that explains why I'm going to spend a significant amount of time uh, talking about centenarians because their aging has been delayed the most. So if you take those two things together, the fact that aging is a major risk for all diseases that, and that we human age at different rates, uh, I wanna say again, if one recovers from cardiovascular disease um, and he had the cardiovascular disease at early rate, he might next get diabetes in younger age also. So it's, it's not only the age relationship to disease is what happens if you can treat one disease and that get, get another. And I have to tell you my fear, I'm doing everything to prevent cardiovascular disease and I'm, I'm just thinking that I'm going straight into Alzheimer and I don't like this thought. Uh, so I wanna make uh, one point uh, that we know from centenarian studies, uh, from my study and uh, unfortunately too few other studies, but this is from Pearl's study, it's New England centenarian study that shows really that the longer we have lived, okay, the healthier uh, people have been. And what you see here is correlation between a age, a, the appearance of age-related diseases and the lifespan of people. And the different lines that you are seeing are lines of people who are either 90, 95, 100, 105, 110 and over, in other words, the, the longer, the, 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 the farther the, the line uh, to the right, the longer they lived. And then there are four associations, and I'm not going to take you through each one of them, four associations that shows that whether it's for cardiovascular disease, all disease, uh, cognitive function, 
the longer you live, the later you get the disease. So there is a relationship between the age of death and the onset of the disease. So, so if, you, if, you, if you're going to live long, you're going to get the disease much later. Now, let me make a little bit a point about, about the challenges that we have. And I drew here just a cartoon and the y-axis shows youthfulness, the scale of youthfulness with age. And basically it shows that youthfulness decline with age. And, and we know those specific examples such as a decline in growth hormone with age or decline in sex hormone with age, both testosterone in men and estrogen are declining with age. And in the middle, you see many black lines and they represent each of our theories of what happens, how things are declining with age. And, and this is the challenges when we think of all those lines that are, are coming here. Some of them are probably uh, causing aging in, in maybe variety of ways. Some of those things that we measure and change with aging, maybe they have a, a, ch a change in aging, but they're not going to kill us in this maximal lifespan that we have of maybe 100 or somewhere between 100 and 120 years. Uh, so there are good biomarkers maybe, but they're not the causes of why we die. So this is okay, but what takes uh, a lot of effort for us is that some of the mechanisms that we are seeing, we are monitoring with aging, are protective mechanism of aging. Because just like when we have infection, we have an inflammatory response. When we have the breakdown of aging, there's a lot, lots of ways for our body to uh, repair itself. And of course, if something that we monitor is a protective mechanism, we don't want to take it back to the youthful level because it protects us. So how do we know what's protective, what's adaptive, what's stressor, what's a modifier uh, with aging? And, and in order to, to demonstrate how severe is this challenge for us, I, I wanna take you through the next few slides. And in the next slide, I'm going to show you what happens when we age to the environment of the body. Okay, what happens when we age, we get more senescent cells. Those are cells that have divided. They're not going to divide anymore, but what happens with them, they're different biologically. And by the way, a lot of our cells are going to be senescent cells. And I'm showing you a data, not to really go through a slide, but just to impress you that you see lots of panels here and you see that they are in blue or in yellow. The blue, represent secretory panel of pre-senescent cells. So they are the normal cells. And the yellow represent a panel of senescent cell. And basically what it shows you as you go from left to right, all those cytokines that are secreted from senescent cell, such as interleukin-6, TNF-alpha, lots of cytokines. So what they're doing is they're changing the intrinsic environment of the body now you have a different interaction than when you were young. And why is it important to know? And that's the only point I'm going to make here. Why is it important? Well, let me give you, and I'm doing a provocation on purpose. Let me, let's talk about estrogen because estrogen was thought to be, you know, the major aging hormone causes, the, the decline in estrogen causes women to age. And if we could just stop it, the, those women will be totally young again. Okay, so we'll modulate it and we'll stop aging. And this study has been done. This is the Women Health Initiative studies. And there are a few things with this, with this study that are problematic the way they were designed, at least problematic from, uh, from people who are also biologists. First of all, you're replacing only one hormone when we know that with aging, there's lots of changes in hormone and, and, and other other, uh, you know, the intrinsic environment and other things. So why is it only replacing estrogen? Why not replace the growth hormone? You know, it's a very unidimensional test. The second problem he is that I just told you that the environment, the intrinsic environment of the body is different when you're 70 than when you're 20. And you don't know what is the interaction. What is the interaction between estrogen and cytokines? Okay, so that's a problem too. And third, 
there is an assumption, okay, that the fact that estrogen is lower, it's, it, it, is, it is because something is wrong, but not because it's actually part of, of, a, of, a, of a potential protection. Maybe estrogen, higher estrogen is harmful, and that's why estrogen is declining. So the Women Health Initiative has done the study. They replaced estrogen. There are some good effects like the skin. You know, the skin was much better, but it was stopped because of many bad effects, including cardiovascular disease, breast cancer, and cognitive decline. So in fact, from an aging perspective, then estrogen was a, was a pro-aging hormone, not an anti-aging uh, hormone, uh, just suggesting how difficult it is to have the instinct of you're just going to replace, uh, replace something. It's also is important for the next sentence that I think is the most important for you to understand. There's no doubt that hormones like estrogen or hormone like testosterone are youthful hormones, but they're youthful hormones on young body. That doesn't mean that they are youthful in old body. And those examples are showing you why in modern biology and genetics, we are choosing to take other paths in order to determine what is truly youthful and, and what is not. So let me uh, go and, and uh, talk a little bit about the genetic of, of human longevity. And I, uh, I would like to um, introduce my, my study and show some of the, of the re results, but I'll, I'll also talk about the state of the art. As I said, not too many studies are out there, but only one out of 10,000 individual is 100 years old. So this is a very rare phenotype. It's more rare than cystic fibrosis. So we recruited almost 600 patients that had to be healthy at age 95. They, ever, they, they spent from 95 to 112, which was our oldest. Um, and basically we were taking people who consider themselves healthy at age 95. As we and other have accumulated those kind of unique uh, rare individual, uh, we found that there is a remarkable family history with exceptional longevity. In other words, the chances of their siblings and parents and everybody else to have longevity was, was many fold increase up to 20 fold increase. So it wasn't a, a small effect. And by the way, the heritability of aging otherwise is not so strong. So it gets stronger only in those extreme age. So with this, we could form two hypotheses. One hypothesis is, you know what? We know all those genotypes that are associated with a variety of age-related disease. You know, those guys have the perfect genome, okay? That's why they don't get the disease. They just don't have SNPs for aging diseases. And I'll tell you already that we know that that's not so. They actually have as many genotypes for aging research, for aging uh, and diseases. And so the other hypothesis is that they have protective genes that assures their longevity. And we have much more support for this concept. So let me introduce you to the centenarians very briefly. What you see here is four siblings taken when the woman who stands on the left was 104. Uh, those are four uh, people who were born between 1910 and 1920 to two parents. And those are the only kids, all those four kids is the only kids that they had. And what's unique with those four kids, all of them passed the age of 102. The woman standing on the left died at 110 and the two brothers are still alive. One of them is 107, almost 108, works every day. And the other is not in a, as good shape, but he's 105 years old. I mean, what are the chances that you have people with such an exceptional uh, longevity? Also interesting to note that we have data from the CDC for years that the, the last two years of medical cost uh, is third in centenarians than in people who are dying between 60 and 70. So it reflects the fact that they were healthy for a long time. And in fact, there is a compression of morbidity. So they die actually after many, many fewer years of diseases. You might say, but hey, 
you know, so maybe there, maybe it's in the family and maybe it's rare and maybe there's genetic component, but maybe it's all the environment. So I, I wanna take care of that uh, for a second and show you highlights of paper that we published a couple of years ago. So if you wonder, almost half of our patients are overweight or obese. So it's not that they've done something special about food or calorically restricted them, not, not as a population. Uh, smoking, 60% of the men, 30% of the women smoked for many years, many packs. Uh, alcohol daily, not enough. Physical activity, well, we're talking about even walking or, or biking or household, less than half were doing anything. So it's not that they're great athletes or something, something like that. For those of you who are vegetarians, I'm really sorry to tell you, not many vegetarians are uh, in the 100 years old group. And by the way, those are, we, we had another group of comparison and they were, sorry, I, uh, I'll figure out to do it a little better. But in another comparison group, they were either worse or the same for their cohort. So in other words, it's not that they interacted with the environment, which leaves again the possibility that they have genes that are different. Well, so I told you that I have a bunch of centenarians and we are uh, looking at them, but hey, what, what, what's the problem with this study? The, the, the problem is I didn't tell you what control group we have and it's, it's hard to get a control group because their friends have died basically 50 years ago. Life expectancy for many of them when they were born was 40 years. So, okay, so they are, so what's the appropriate control group? And what we've done here, we've done something uh, unique, we recruited their offspring. And the importance of their offspring that they're enriched with the longevity genotype and phenotype. There are lots of other issues here for why and how we use the offspring. But one important point is that uh, we can match the offspring by age and gender. And so we have offspring that are matched to age, age match control without longevity in their family. So the ones who are unrelated to the centenarians and are still young and are unlikely to be 100 is the control group. And we see the genetics compared to the centenarians themselves. Now, one of the problems with genetic research that is a big challenge is that if you just walk in the streets of you know, Los Angeles or New York and look for uh, candidates, uh, you'll get diversity of the population. And this diversity is immediately a nightmare in a, in a genetic point of view. So the best, the best group in the world probably to have a, a successful genetic contribution that affected health are, are probably the Icelandic. The Icelandic where uh, five Vikings and four Irish women and everybody there is, is their are, are brothers or, or, or cousins. So, so if somebody has disease within this population or not, it's much easier to identify the genetic component of that. For that reason, we're using Ashkenazi Jews. Those are white uh, European uh, genomes that have a, a reason for, for lots of, lots of uh, history, a lot of bad history too, but they're considered homogeneous more than just taking the white population alone. And just to show you that we're kind of uh, on the way uh, and, 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 and we're doing a, a study that is reasonable is that during the recruitment, it was already clear that the offspring of centenarians were healthier than control. So the offspring of centenarians in blue have less hypertension, less diabetes mellitus, less myocardial infarction and less stroke. But I wanna bring in the centenarians themselves here in green, because the centenarians who are 30 years older than the control group have barely the same prevalence of hypertension, much less diabetes, and about the same prevalence of myocardial infarction and stroke. So it shows you that their aging has been basically delayed by 30 years. It, just to continue this point to larger scale study, there are other support that the age of parent is uh, affecting the onset of age-related disease. In other words, if you had old parent, you got the disease later. 
And one is from the diabetes prevention trial. And the diabetes prevention trial uh, took people at risk of diabetes and gave them either metformin or lifestyle as an intervention that were both successful. Metformin decreased uh, diabetes by 30%. Uh, and I asked the people in the B DPP if the age of one of the, uh, the father or the mother had any effect on the onset of diabetes in this trial. And the example here is of the, or is the paternal side. The same is true for the, for the maternal side. And you see three graphs that are reflecting models. So it's not really important. You can follow the red line just to be, or the blue line, uh, just for simplicity. And it shows you that if you have one parent that lived over the age of 80, whether it was father and mother, as I said before, you had a 30% reduction in the onset of diabetes. In other words, choosing your parent right, having an old parent that survived over the 80, was as effective as taking metformin when you had prediabetes. The same thing is true to a study that I was uh, involved with on people that were recruited from the community and we asked if they had one parent over the age of 85, did uh, it affect the onset of Alzheimer? And as you see here, uh, people who had one parent over the age of 85, that's the, the upper group, had a delay of Alzheimer or cognitive decline in about 30%. So you, you have to understand, it's not only that centenarians are unique, but any uh, uh, age, any advanced age of the parent has an impact on the age where their kids are getting this disease. So how do we go in making a, a genetic discoveries from this uh, study? Well, uh, you know, there, um, there, uh, there, there's an a, a opportunity here that doesn't exist in other thing. And that is that, um, that um, we have the age axis, okay? And the age axis is totally selected. In other words, um, um, when people, people die at the average age of 80, uh, in the United States, half of the people die. So if, we, if we're populating with people who are 85, 90, 95, and 100, we're selecting them for longevity. If we're selecting them for longevity, then if we get a pattern like that, it, where a genotype start disappearing, and it's very rare at age 100, it's killing them. But if we have a genotype that is uh, increasing and it's high at age 100, we would say, you know what? They, are, uh, they have protective genes and, and they are living, um, and, and this is maybe the reason, that's longevity genes, and that's the reason why they're enriching centenarians. And some of them are not changing. There are several genotypes that I want to talk about. One genotype is called FOXO3A. And the interesting thing about the FOXO3A genotype is that it was validated by at least eight groups. Okay, so it's the most validated genotype, and validation is really difficult in uh, studies. Um, uh, although it's validated, it's the less understood because there's nothing else that comes out on why it's important. There, there's no changes in under intermediate genotype. The, the genes, the, the genotypes that, that, that could be of functional significance, we don't find them. So it's, it's kind of an interesting observation, but we don't know yet what to make of it. On the other hand, there are many other genotypes that have been discovered and validated uh, before, and I'll go from the lower to the upper, but because all of them are, are uh, published, I'll just say a line about each one of them. And we'll start in the lower one that goes from almost 0% to 2% in centenarians, and this is a functional mutation in IGF receptor. Interestingly, in nature, the dwarf live longer. The ponies live longer than the horse. The, the, the small dogs live longer than the large dogs. And so there's something that is conserved also in animals, in evolution. And we have those uh, small group of centenarians that have this functional mutation and we think it helped them get to this age. The two above that, that go from about 10% to about 20% are, 
are two genotypes, lipid genotypes. One is APOC3 and one, are, one is CTP. Both of them are carrying a phenotype, a lipid phenotype. So lipid are important modulator of longevity, mainly HDL is the marker for their effect. And the higher two, one is a thyroid a TSH, a TSH receptor abnormality. Centenarians have higher TSH. They, uh, their, their children have higher TSH, so it's a heritable TSH. They, have, they are not hypothyroid, but they have lower T3 and T4. And the major point here is when you have TSH that's high, centenarians don't treat it because maybe it allows them to get there. And the other is adiponectin. Adiponectin is a, is a, a, a fed-derived hormone that has very good effects and adiponectin level is very high in centenarians and uh, maybe each one of them uh, can contribute to longevity significantly. I, I want to make one point. When we look at those genotypes, we want them to be protective against aging. You know, we hope they delay aging. Maybe they delay several age-related diseases. Maybe even they delay a, a one age disease. But the CTP uh, genotype is very important because it demonstrates that CTP uh, or these lipid levels are not only important for cardiovascular disease, but they're also important for cognitive function. And what you see here is a study that shows that if you had the two alleles for the CTP genotype that are in red, uh, you would have a 70% decline in dementia-free survival and Alzheimer-free survival. So they seem to be very protective for cognitive uh, function. So just to make the point that uh, that you need to show effect on many age-related diseases in order to see that it really delays aging. Another thing that is important with the CTP is that there is a drug company that is developing CTP inhibitor. And uh, just to make the point, and they, they published uh, initial results there in phase three trial, but the point here is that from finding genetic studies to getting drugs is sometimes not long. And of course, this drug has to be tried and see if it delays aging or it delays the diseases, but it's very important to realize that that's important. Um, so, you know, how can we discover mechanism of action on longevity genes? Well, we can do functional tests, which we have done. We can look at inter the functional test. The example is the IGF receptor. We found we could do functional tests. Uh, the lipid shows that we can do intermediate phenotype. We can see the HDL, the LDL, the lipoprotein particle size, or we can associate with outcomes. But there's another thing that we can do that is, uh, is, is, is kind of unique to what we've been doing. And I'll exemplify it very shortly in the next few slides. And this is how it goes. Clotto is one of those killing genes. Okay, in fact, in our population, like in other population, the people who have clotto disappear. By age of 85, we have half of the people that we had when we took, took a group of people in 60. So we think it's killing people. So we are assuming that at age 104, there'll be hardly anyone with a clotto genotype. When in fact, we find that at age 100, they have almost the same amount of clotto genotype, almost the same prevalence as, as the, um, as in, in the young one. So what is it? How is this genotype? Looks like it's an, an, aging, an aging genotype, and then it looks like it's a longevity genotype. Well, after lots of sleepless night, we realize that if you're, if you're the rare guy that's going to be 100 years old, and you have a protective genotype, you can harbor maybe a variety of genotypes that are bad for you, except that you're not, you're not going to care for them because you're protected. So in fact, at age 100, we would expect, and that's, as I told you, we found, many of us found that we find all those other genotypes that are bad for you. And, but the most important thing is that we can use this U-shape curve in order to look at mechanism. And I'll jump through the next uh, slide just to get to this example. And this is an example of LP little a. LP little a is another lipoprotein that's associated with cardiovascular death. 
and it drops in our population until age 80, you lose 20, you know, half of the genotype, but at age 100, there is a lot of them. And so what we do, we, we do a gene to gene interaction where we take all the people with the bad LPA uh, genotype and we look at every longevity genotype. And when we got to CTP, this is the example that I'm, I'm carrying you through. When we got to CTP, we got the following. People who didn't have the good CTP genotype versus the people who, got, who had the good CTP genotype. So the people who had the good CTP genotype in green accounted for the majority of people um, that could harbor LPLA. -A. In other words, they are alive because they have LPLA, because, because they have CTP genotype. And actually Merck in their study have uh, shown that in a preliminary way also. Lastly, I wanna make a few points about how the environment interacts with genes, because certainly the environment has a lot to do with aging. And, and so I'll give you two examples. One is, uh, through methylation. And the important thing to know is that methylation, uh, sorry, I'm doing those same mistakes again. The important thing to know that uh, methylation is a way to control gene expression. Um, and when we used to talk about epigenetic, we thought, you know, it happens early and it's done. But what we're discovering is that epigenetic modulation happens in almost every tissue throughout life. And what we're seeing here divided by the, the black line in the middle, on the right, we see people who are 65 years old, on the left, people who are 95 years old. And this is a, a very high throughput essay that looks at methylation sites throughout the genome, like 3 million methylation sites throughout the genome in, in places where we think are important, may, may be important for physiology. And you see that it's very different. The left and the right side are very different. On the right side, the upper panel is yellow. And on the right side, the 65 years old is quite red. By the way, there are 75 and 85 there that are kind of in the middle. Uh, but you see how we can go throughout it. It becomes red in 95 and then yellow in control, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, there's a lot of epigenetic modulation that's going on that in part to have a sequence, a consequence, and we'll figure out the consequence of that, not so easy, uh, but, but that's a, an important direction, and it has a lot to do with aging and how we're protected against aging. The second epigenetic mechanism is by microRNA. So what you see in the panel is centenarians on the right side under the yellow bar, and controls on the left side under the red bar, and you see variety of microRNA. And under the centenarians, you see those red lines. Those are uh, centenarians who have very high expression of microRNAs. MicroRNA usually go down with aging, but centenarians have microRNA that seems to be overrepresented or overexpressed, and lots of them have a major role in, uh, in biological uh, processes. So, I'm, I'm going to stop here in microRNA, but the last two slides just meant to tell you that there's a lot of epigenetic things that are going aging and it contributes immensely to the aging phenotype. So I want to uh, get this, uh, get to the question and answer period and summarize that uh, it's important to realize in my message here that if you can prevent aging, you may prevent its diseases. The biology of aging is exciting. It's, uh, it's unexpected. Uh, it shows you what happens when all the studies we're doing in animals are in young animals, uh, and, and you get a little bit different view than when you wait for those animals to be old because the environment is old. Uh, but if we could do anything with this biology of aging, we can probably make progress in diseases. I showed you example that research to the biology and genetic of aging is bearing fruits or bearing medications. 
and that we can actually uh, understand genetic mechanisms. I gave you an example of how by interaction between genes, between those U-shaped uh, genotypes and longevity genotypes, we can find how longevity gene uh, protects against a certain aging gene. So if we have a longevity gene that protects against many genes, we can maybe develop one drug to affect all those diseases and we don't need more. Um, also, I made a, a, a point that the interaction between the environment and genes work in an epigenetic uh, mechanism. I gave you two examples, you know, a very a, a prominent example, you know, in the media is resveratrol, the wine extract, that uh, observation that came from the biology of aging that resveratrol extends life. And, and uh, there is another pharmaceutical company that has some patents to activate the pathways that are involved in, in resveratrol. But the mechanism here is also epigenetics, is, is through histone deacetylation. So those are the major points I, uh, I wanted to make. Um, I also, you know, wanna, want you to understand, and I, I showed you the relationship between age of death and onset of disease. There, there's more uh, evidence that, that if you can get to higher age, you're going to contract morbidity. In other words, people will be healthier for longer and they'll die much sooner after the onset of the diseases than if they had to carry those diseases at early age for many years. So uh, what we want is not to live longer. We want to have a good quality of life. So uh, our, our goals in all, those, all this research in the biology of aging and genetic of aging is to uh, come up with some drugs that can be tested to see if they prevent the chronic debilitating uh, related disease of aging. And this longevity, longer life is more of a side effect of the drugs and we'll have to apologize, but uh, we want to come up from uh, the point of view that we're, we're uh, trying to prevent age-related diseases. Uh, this is my uh, grandmother-in-law in her 100th uh, birthday, and she taught me a lot about uh, what I know about uh, uh, longevity. At her 100th birthday, she drank this resveratrol straight from uh, the bottle. She was dating then uh, men, but only those who could drive. And she complained that to find somebody that could drive, had, she had to decrease the age of date to 85 years old and they were a little young for her. Uh, and she died without being sick any day in her life and without taking any medications. And I'm, I'm kind of jealous on her achievement. So let me stop now and, uh, and see if I can uh, have any uh, question and I'll be happy to answer them. Not seeing any questions yet. Okay, I see some question. So the first, the first question is. Uh, um, how have you excluded family, dietary habits, and environment? And I think maybe it was written before I started uh, talking about it. It's a, it's a good question. But as I said, our population uh, and other population of centenarians, when you're trying to find if they were distinct, they were not distinct. In fact, what's really funny is that sometimes they, uh, they just say that, um, um, 
you know, we ate chicken fat all our lives. They give the examples of what they think is associated with longevity that we wouldn't necessarily tell, tell our patient uh, to do. So there's no, uh, there, there's no doubt that the environment is uh, important. And if you want to get to behind the age of 80, you have to do what you need to do to deal with the environment. But this is not the case for our centenarians, and that's why they're so interesting. Second question, does the atypical TSH level uh, reduce, uh, reduce risk of thyroid disease in centenarians? And I cannot say that I know that. Our centenarians have been uh, healthy and uh, very few of them had thyroid disease, but I, I cannot say that the TSH level itself, itself uh, affected thyroid disease. Okay, another interesting question, which I expected is about telomeres. And we did measure telomeres to our centenarians and their telomeres are, are longer than the telomeres of 85 year old without longevity in their family. Okay, they're significantly longer. But what does it mean? That's the question, what does it mean? Are they healthy and that's why their telomere are longer? Or is the telomere have to do anything with their age? I, I don't want to go to a big controversy, but I would just tell you that even if you knock down the telomeres in, in, in mice, they don't age more uh, rapidly. Uh, you need to do a lot of manipulation and a lot of generation in order to start getting sperms with low, low, low telomeres that will affect, uh, will affect them. But the telomere question, whether it's cause and effect, is still a big question. The telomeres have the ability to modulate uh, uh, themselves. Um, period of stress decrease telomere length. Period of recovery increase telomere length. It's very, it's, it's very uh, complex. Uh, I would say it could be a marker for longevity, but it doesn't mean it's a cause for longevity. Next question, is there any particular region of chromosome from which this microRNA either express or do this uh, map back to, uh, I cannot see uh, the next line, I'm sorry. Um, uh, complicated, those microRNA, uh, you know, I think the answer, because this is a specific question, you could watch potentially, you can look at PubMed, put my name and Sue, S-U-H, Yushin, uh, Y, and, and see some of the preliminary data that uh, we had, and you'll have an answer. Have any apoptotic pathway studies been done in centenarians to understand the expression level? Um, so I want to tell you that we have a, a lymphoblast of those centenarians, and we're doing lots of uh, stress response on those lymphoblasts, those lymphoblasts are not prone to apopto apoptosis. And on a genetic level, there are several genotypes that are apoptotic genotypes that are different between centenarian and control, not in a very significant way, but this is certainly a, a way, to, uh, something to look, to look at. Next question, a man uh, stopped, um, a man stopped smoking just two years ago. He's about 91 year old now and he's still alive, could it be the presence of, uh, for some reason I cannot go uh, down the line, uh, the, the line here, but uh, this woman who died at 110 years old, um, she smoked for 95 years. So first of all, if you smoke for 95 years, you do live a long life, uh, I can promise that, but uh, the point is that she was protected from the effect of, of, uh, of cigarettes. Uh, what is, uh, for a 91 year old, what, what is smoking uh, going to do? I, I don't know, I need to know a little bit more about that. Uh, next question. Uh, uh, is the rate of mutagenesis lower in centenarians? We don't know this answer. So telomere length can, uh, can increase. Are you saying that telomere length is more of an effect of age and genes rather than, again, I'm sorry that I cannot find a way to see the end of your question. Uh, yeah, telomere, telomere length 
uh, can, can change positively. Uh, let, let me make it clear. Telomere length on average goes down with aging, okay? E even in longitudinal study, you take a man and follow it five or 10 years later, telomere length will decrease. The question is, uh, does it lead to aging? And I think it probably doesn't lead to aging. Uh, there, are, there are diseases in human like uh, primary pulmonary fibrosis where there's no lung tissues left. And I think at that point, the telomere is playing a major role in the phenotype of this disease. But that's not to say that telomeres are leading the aging. A uh, last question that I have is, is there any study of longevity genes from other ethnic groups from comparison? Yes, uh, absolutely. It's very important. We actually are leading an international effort to get centenarians from all over the world. And let me give an example of the complexity, and I'll go back to this CTP, this genotype that I, I put in uh, as an example for many things. So this specific polymorphism on the CTP gene uh, does not exist in Japanese, okay? But they have another mutation in the CTP gene, and that is significantly different than others. So, so it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's going to be a challenge to go from population to population. The major thing to realize is that we're not interested in a certain genotype. The certain genotype in certain population um, leads us to a mechanism, okay? So for example, with the CTP, the people with the CTP had high HDL cholesterol, high good cholesterol. For me, this is what's important now. If you go to another population and you take the same genotype and they don't have higher HDL, it's because we're not built with one, from one genotype in the, uh, at a time. We're built from many genotypes that in a certain background would either have a phenotype or not have a phenotype. So it is important to see everything about that and not to focus on a specific SNP. Um, I'm, I'm waiting for, a, I'll wait a minute to see if there's any other um, question. Um, uh, Okay, I think, um, I think I want to thank, I think the, those questions were absolutely to the point. I want to thank uh, you for listening. And I hope I, um, I made a case of why delaying aging can be really good uh, for, for, for everyone. Thanks very much.